Uh, if you're still with me, this is the last step in the process and I'm gonna take you through quickly how to true the wheels. I'm gonna focus on the rear wheel because it's a bit more involved. The rear wheel takes a bit more patience. It was prescribed for allergies and respiratory problems. Well, the first thing you need to do when you're truing your wheels is establish what tension you can use in the spokes. And that mainly comes from how strong the rim is or how strong the spoke holes in the rim are. So find out what the manufacturer recommends for your rim as the max tension. Generally, the higher you can go, the better. So the non-drive side is always a lower tension than the drive side. Why is that? Well, it's because angle of the spokes on the non-drive side is wider. The horizontal component force vector is, is greater than on the drive side. The drive side, you have to fit the cassette on. So the, stroke, the spokes end up being almost straight up to the rim. So you need a lot higher tension in that spoke to have the same horizontal bracing force as the non-drive side. But in general, hubs for 11-speed cassettes have about between 45 and 60% tension ratio non-drive side to drive side. So what does that mean? That means if you've got 100 kilos in the drive side, that means you can only have between 45 and 60 kilos in the non-drive side. And that's just a function of the geometry of the hub. So first thing you need to do, find out what your rim is rated to in terms of spoke tension and try and get as high to that as possible, close to that as possible. Second thing you need to do, second, before you do any truing, find out the tension ratio of the flanges. There's calculators to do this online, but it's largely a function of the flange spacing from the center line uh, and the flange height. That dictates how much tension you need in the non-drive side. It, all, it can all change with, you know, if you've got offset drillings in the rim, angle drillings, the, the sort of bracing angle of the rim it can all change a little bit. And it depends if your spokes are heads in or heads out because the spokes that heads out have marginally smaller bracing angle than the heads in. The heads in come slightly wider angle. So let's say you, would do, you were doing this all radial on the, on the non-drive side. Let's say you were going for all radial lacing on the non-drive side. If you wanted to get more tension in the spokes, you'd do heads out because you'd have a less of a bracing angle. That means you could put more tension into them to equal the sort of transverse lateral force in, in the drive side. So that's number two, tension ratio, and find out if you've got, let's say 120 kilos in this one, find out what you need to get to in this one. And then, and then when you put the wheel in the bike, you can see then, um, once these are at the right tension, let's say 120, and you get 60 in these for a 50% tension ratio, then you'll be able to see if that's enough to keep the wheel centered. That's basically point two done. Step three, before you put any sort of serious tension in any of the spokes, kind of go around each spoke and make sure, let's say, about two or one mil of threads showing in each spoke. And that shows you that you've got kind of the same starting point in all the spokes. I've got another video on truing wheels, and I mentioned in that one that if you're trying to true a wheel with spokes at all different starting tensions, even if they're low, it's gonna be really hard to true later on. So get every spoke exposing the same number of threads or engaged on the same number of threads before you start adding any tension. That way you can go around and almost put like equal number of turns in on every spoke and it should come into tension evenly and you won't be dealing with a wheel that's wobbling massively side to side or radi radially hopping up and down. Step number four, start bringing the drive side. The drive side is kind of your reference side, that's what you want to be working on and then you use the non-drive side to basically centre the wheel, centre the the dish, put the wheel over the centre of the dropouts. That's what you use the drive side tension for, but you want to be getting the right tension in the drive side first. So go around all the drive side spokes, turning them two or three turns, all the same. And just keep checking with the tension meter what tension you're getting in the drive side. And they should all be coming up by roughly the same amount. At this point, don't, ten don't touch the non-drive side. And before you start worrying about lateral wobble, you need to check that you haven't got so much radial hop and then after that, you can, you, can really, you can really start bringing the drive side into tension. And I've got to a stage now where I'm about 100 kilos up. I haven't even touched really the non-drive side. And you'll find that as you're tensioning these, as the wheel gets pulled over, the drive side will come, the non-drive side, sorry, will come into, start coming into tension on its own. You'll still have to measure it and you might have to let some out or add some here and there to true it. But you'll find that because the rim is basically getting shorter on this side that the tension has to increase. So I'm going to show you now where I am with around 100 kilos in the drive side. It's not true 
it's got wobble in it and it's too far over to the non-drive side. Now before I started I centered the calipers in the frame using actually a caliper, but a vernier caliper or a vernier gauge. So these, this is basically my true in stand. It's not perfect, but it's going to make this wheel exact in this bike. Like it doesn't matter if it's exact in a true in stand because you don't ride the, the wheel in a true in stand, you ride it in your bike. Now it might not be centered perfectly through the chain stays because basically modern carbon bikes have asymmetrical chain stays. You see, normally the non drive side chain stay here is much thicker than the drive side the drive side chain stay and the drive side chain stay is always thinner because you have to fit the chain rings in there so they can't push out as wide as the non drive side and the, they use the non drive side extra thickness to gain some more pedaling stiffness especially on something like a Cannondale BB30A or Cervelo BB right type bottom bracket the non drive side chain stay is always massive and you look at the bike and you look at the tire clearance between the two chain stays and you think hang on the, the wheel's not dished properly in the frame but it is it's tracking through the center line of the frame but because one one chain stay is so much bigger than the other it looks like it's not perfect so don't really worry about that that's why I use the seat stays really because the seat stays are they're not obviously perfect because of manufacturing tolerances but they're more symmetrical than the chain stays so I measure with the calipers the seat stays and get that centered. So I'm going to show you now the run out of the wheel. There's about 100, and, 100 to 110 in the in the drive side. And I don't really know. I haven't been checking too much in the non-drive side, but probably about 40. So we're nearly there, but I'll show you that the wheel is quite out of shape. It probably looks like the wheel is pretty much true. And to some extent it is, but if I start bringing in, bringing in the pads, it doesn't take a lot to completely lock the wheel up. And there's what I call a high spot, so the wheel's too far this way. Here, you can hear it rubbing. So that will be, I'll mark that on the rim, that point there where it's touching. As you never really work in single spokes when you're truing, it's best to work in pairs or triplets. This probably needs to let some tension out and the two drive side spokes either side, this one and this one, I'll put maybe an eighth of a turn on and pull the wheel that way and see if that helps. Obviously whilst I'm doing that, I'll be checking the tensions to make sure I'm not exceeding the limits. If I'm exceeding the limits, then that's an alarm bell, then something's gone wrong. You know, if these, if these two are nearly at 120 kilograms and this one hasn't got so much tension and the wheel still needs to go that way, you really need to stop and think maybe there's something else going on with the wheel maybe some tensions are too high somewhere else but before actually I even touch these I'll pluck them and see if there's any really low or under tensioned or over tensioned sounding spokes relative to the other spokes kind of next next door if you like um, or I'll just use the tension meter but if you're working basically up from a, a like a low tension plucking them is quite a good idea because keep clipping on the tension meter and unclipping it is, is a bit annoying and you can't do it very quickly but now i'm up to tension i will use the tension meter because i don't want to risk exceeding the limit that that high spot runs for about a good 30 40 degrees around the rim so i'm probably going to have to work on six or seven spokes to eliminate that high spot but what what you can't see actually in general at the moment is the wheel is too far to the non-drive side so although it's straight, I need to work on getting the whole wheel over to the drive side. And I'll do that, and then um, we'll see what tensions we get. So I've just clipped the tension meter onto the non-drive side, and actually this non-drive side spoke is already really low, but the wheel is still too far this way, so it's not that spoke necessarily that's pulling the wheel this way because the tension's very low. So the next step is to check the neighbouring drive side spokes either side of that and see if they're low and can be pulled this way. If they can't, if they're already tight, then it's going to be the neighbouring spokes. And this is where it comes down to if everything is equal and nothing looks really out and they're still going that way, then that's a tolerance in the rim drillings. That means that one of the rim drillings has been drilled slightly off the center line and it is giving you a higher horizontal force vector than you should have, meaning that you need less tension in the spoke to pull the rim over to this side. You know, the higher quality the rim and the hub drillings, the more even the tension is going to be in a true wheel. If you've got a very poor uh, quality wheel with drillings that are kind of all over the place then when you have the wheel in true the further apart each tension is going to be a very quality rim will have very even tensions when it's true so now what i'm doing now is i'm actually trying to bring the whole wheel this way so i'm going around every drive side spoke 
checking the tension and then giving about a half turn and then I'll sort out the rest of the wobble later and I really want to get them done today and ride them today. But uh, yeah, so obviously I use a chart for when I'm using the tension meter to, to know what the actual tension is. Once you've done the wheels a couple of times and you're using the same spokes, the CX rays, you get to know you get to know which number on the uh, which number on the tool corresponds to what tension. So I'm going for 120 kilos, and I know what number on the tool that means. It's between 14 and 15. So as long as I don't go over 15 on the tool, then I'll be happy. I might have to go slightly higher than 120 kilos, so I get some good tension in the non-drive side. Because if these aren't high enough, you can't, you can never get decent tension in these, and the wheel will be too fast for the non-drive side. And see what I'm doing now is after I put the tension on, I'm winding the spoke a quarter of a turn back. That's because there's wind up in the spoke, torsional wind up, and I'm trying to relax that. I don't want that to unwind whilst I'm riding it. Now these bladed spokes, you should really use the spoke holder to stop you twisting as, as, uh, as, as you're doing them up. But actually, they don't twist more than about a quarter of a turn. And that's not that bad. It kind of helps them. Helps them settle in a bit, I think. And then I can manually, by, by letting them twist, I, I get a feeling for how much wind-up's in them. And then, I'll, then I know how much to wind it back. If you use a spoke holder, you don't get that, that feel. Right, so just by changing the drive side and not touching the non-drive side, I've pulled the wheel more center in the brakes now. But you can see, even with even spoke, I've got even spoke tension on the non-drive side now, and it's pretty much as high as it wants to be. But you can see there's quite there's quite a lot of uh, run out there. So I'm just going to go around and find where that high spot is. And to find it, to know where it's coming from, left or right. You, I mean, the difficult thing is, is the move, is the wheel moving that way? to the drive side, or is it coming this way to the non-drive side? Where's that wobble? Where is the center of that wobble? And the only way to really find that out quickly is to basically close up your, your gauge. So I'm using the brake pads. And the first chafe, the first chuff there is on the non-drive side. So that tells me, actually there's only one. And you always want to work on the worst one. You always want to work on the worst run out. If you've got a couple, let's say you've got a bit of scuffing there and then maybe half a turn you've got some scuffing on this side you always want to work on the worst one where there's the most movement or the most friction on the brake pads luckily I've only got one per rotation at the moment if I close those calipers in again then I might find another one but there's the first one so I'm going to work on that so there's the first scuff on this side now how am I going to decide what to do so I'm in my head visualizing the arc of where it's touching so it starts around there and it ends around here. So it's around 30 degrees of, 30 degrees kind of segment of this wheel needs to go that way. So within that kind of imaginary arc, I'm gonna look at all the spoke tensions and see if they are where they should be. That one's borderline high, so that might be it. I'm looking at all the, the non-drive side first. That one's very high, so this one, exactly where we've got some rubbing, is too high. So that's that's a free lunch. We know that one's good to let to let some tension out of that one. The next one, which will be this one, is probably all right because it's not touching there, but we'll check it. No, that's bang on. So this one is high, this one, and it's pulling. That's a pulling it into the brake pad. So I'm going to wind some off of that. That was it. And there we go, we're not touching now. We're not touching. So just a sixth of a turn on that spoke has sorted that problem out. Obviously, there's still a lot of kick in that wheel, but that high point is gone. So now bring the calipers in again, and then you can continue the process. So we've got another high spot here. Might be in the same place. That's running for a bit longer. That's almost, that's almost 90 degrees. 
rubbing on this side. So I'm going to repeat that process, check the tensions, check the easy ones first on the, on the non-drive side and see if there are any that are too high. End of the arc there. That's fine. That's fine. Borderline high on that one. And by plucking it, that's the high one, that's where it's touching the brake pad. Plucking it next to the next one. Is, is relatively high. So maybe I can let some tension out of that one. It is reading a bit high on the, on the meter. So I'm gonna suspect that one and we'll check that. So we're nearly there now. Just a final few more tweaks. So then I'm gonna stick uh, the tire on, get it up to pressure and then check it with the tire on because you've got a load of hoop stress from the quite high pressure in the tube and the tire it can do things to the spoke tension. So I'll stick the tire on and check it. And then I'm gonna take him for a ride because it's pretty much done. Actually, I might just take it for a ride even though it's not perfect because you've gotta sort of pre-stress the wheels and I'm gonna throw the bike side to side, do some kind of sprints and lay the bike over a bit and then bring it home and true them up again because there's no point getting them perfect now because they probably will shift a bit when I'm out on the road. So I'm gonna call that done, stick the tire on, just do a final check with the tire on. And uh, I'll take it out and see how it goes. The other thing I didn't mention is swapping the brake pads over. Don't forget to change the brake pads. Now, I always like with carbon rims to run the brake pads as close down on the brake track as possible, not right near the top. Because the brake track is stronger in that area. At the top of the brake track, there's nothing supporting them. and You're more likely to do damage at the top. 